Welcome to Black Gumbo Southern Gardening. We're going to talk about bad advice. Well, the garden's really starting to take off with this warm spell that we've been having. And all the plants have, you know, they've left that infant stage where they're tiny and small and they're starting to grow. Some of them are starting to put on fruit. And it's at about this time that plants often show uh, signs of, uh, of disease or pest or something's not looking right or it's not growing well. Uh, this is about the time when your freshly prepared beds start growing weeds. And a lot of people go online and get on Facebook forums or, or Facebook groups and forums and they ask questions. What's wrong with my plant? What's wrong with my soil? A lot of the advice that people give out these days, it's really bad advice. The, f the first thing I see people get really upset about uh, is weeds. And the, there's this idea out there that if you have even a single weed in your garden, somehow your garden's imperfect and you're a bad gardener. Weeds just go along with gardening. This idea that we need to eradicate every single weed out of our garden, it's just not good advice. It's bad advice. It's impossible to get all the weeds. You can come in and pull weeds away from your plants when you see them and, uh, you know, hoe and mulch and do all the things, but you're still going to encounter weeds. They're going to come up everywhere because they're weeds. They're sturdy, hardy plants. They grow natively. Uh, they grow in the worst of soils, the worst conditions. And when you give all this wonderful soil to your plants, well, the weeds are going to love it too. And so, like, you know, in this soil, I've got nut sedge, I've got purslane, I've got cooch grass or something like cooch grass. I've got Bermuda grass right here. I've got wood sorrels. There's lots of weeds in here, but it's okay. They're not going to harm your plants unless the garden bed just gets taken over with weeds. All you have to do is just stay on top of it and keep a reasonable amount of weed pressure down off your plants. If you see one or two weeds, you're not a bad gardener. In fact, this particular bed has been uh, weed bound, um, well, twice. I, I let it go fallow one year and I laid down some stuff on top, uh, some old carpet that I had thinking that that would keep the weeds down. Now they just grew right through it. This entire bed was filled with Bermuda grass and uh, yeah, well, we reclaimed it and you can see it's a perfectly good bed. Most of these plants can grow even with weeds. In fact, some weeds are beneficial. You can eat this purslane. It's a superfood. This weed is not even a weed. It's a marigold. It came up voluntarily. There's a carrot that came up voluntarily. These were not planned for this space, so technically speaking, they're weeds. There are two ways to deal with weeds, and neither of them are perfect. Neither, neither of them are going to give you a weed-free garden. One of them is to mulch. Mulch helps to suppress weeds. Mulch is a good idea all around. If you don't mulch, like right here in this section of my garden, there's no mulch on this ground. I wanted to see how much weed pressure my plants would get with my compost and to see if I had fewer weeds this year than last year. Well, if you don't mulch, you could just take a stirrup hoe like this one right here and just run it under the surface of the soil uh, where your weeds are coming up and you'll cut those weeds down. Just leave them laying there and the sun will bake them and they'll die. Well, here's another bit of bad advice that I heard just the other day in a Facebook group for gardeners. And the original poster asked, hey, I've got mushrooms coming up in my garden. What should I do about it? And the very first response said, well, you need to eradicate mushrooms and mushrooms are a sign of bad soil. Now, I thought to myself, what? I thought every gardener on earth knew that mushrooms are not a sign of bad soil. In fact, mushrooms are a sign of good soil. Mushroom uh, are, they're, they're a fungus. They, they grow in the soil. They feed on the woody chips and the, and the organic material in your soil. And fungal life grows in the soil. It sends out a web of, of uh, like spidery tissue, goes out all through soil. It's that white stuff you see in there. Uh, mycorrhizal fungi is a benefit to your soil. It helps your plants take up nutrients from the soil. It's a symbiotic relationship. All fungal life in soil is good for your soil, um, pretty much. And if you see mushrooms in there, you shouldn't want to eradicate them. Just enjoy them for what they are. They come up, they send out their spores, and then they die. So you don't have to worry about it. Mushrooms are good for your soil. Here at my compost bin, I'm looking down at my compost in there, and it's got bugs in it. And uh, people online sometimes say, you shouldn't have bugs in your compost. That's a sign that it's not breaking down or it's imbalanced to one side or the other. That's not true. The bugs are actually doing their, their work in there for you. They're breaking things down. Even if you've got perfectly balanced 
uh, perfectly heating up compost and it's way up in the 160s area, you know your compost is breaking down really well by bacterial life, but you dig in there, you're still going to find bugs. You find earwigs, pill bugs, uh, little tiny mites, all kinds of roaches, beetles, all kinds of bugs live in compost. And they're just doing your job, uh, their job for you. They're breaking it down and they're leaving their droppings behind and they're helping to make compost. Don't worry about bugs. People sometimes get freaked out when they dig into their compost and they see these giant maggots, those big ones, you know, from the black soldier fly. Leave them there, man. They're doing great work for you. They'll uh, pupate and fly away. And by the time you need your compost, and once it's all broken down, most of those uh, macro devourers, those uh, macro organisms like bugs and roaches, they'll be long gone because there's nothing left for them to eat. Don't worry about bugs in your compost. It's bad advice to try to eradicate the bugs in your compost unless they happen to be like carpenter ants or fire ants or termites and then you might have to deal with it. But for the stuff we all, all uh, want, that black gold out of our compost pile, let the bugs do part of the work for you. So this is just a scoop of compost. It's breaking down. I see some tiny little bugs running around there. They're going to lose it all. Yeah, lots of life in here. That's what you want. Look at all these tomato plants. They're doing great. I am so happy with my tomatoes this year. And I've got a whole bunch of varieties in here. And that's some bad advice you often hear. People will say, you can't plant multiple varieties together. Otherwise, they're going to cross-pollinate. Of course, they're going to cross-pollinate. But why is that a problem unless you save seeds? See, here's what's going to happen. The plants are, in fact, going to cross-pollinate. Bees and flies and wasps and bugs that go from flower to flower are going to carry pollen from each of those flowers and carry it over to other plants. And it's going to pollinate those plants and they're going to grow and produce fruit. But the fruit on the plant will always be true to type. The fruit will always be, for example, a brandywine tomato is always going to produce a brandywine tomato on that plant, even if it gets cross-pollinated. In fact, some plants actually benefit from cross-pollination. There are certain trees that must have another, uh, another type of the same, uh, another cultivar of the same species of tree in order to pollinate. But what people mean that cross-pollination is bad is that you can't save those seeds from that fruit and expect to get the same kind of seed each year. What you're going to get is a hybrid. But see, the hybridization happens in the seeds. And so whenever, let's say I have tomatoes cross-pollinating here, and I will, I'm going to get fruit that's true to the type that I planted, but I can't save that seed and expect the next generation, next year, to be the same type. And well, if you're into experimentation, that could be fun. That's how, that's how varieties are made. Cross-pollination is how we do hybrids. So don't worry about it. You're, you can plant all the stuff, like tons of peppers, tons of pumpkins, tons of tomatoes. Yes, they're going to cross-pollinate, but your type is going to be true to type this year. Next year, though, your seeds will be wonky, they'll be hybrids, and you might get some surprising results. So don't worry about planting things together if you don't save the seeds. You know, this bed and this bed a couple years ago were wrecked. And all the plants, I had to pull the tomato plants up. I didn't get any tomatoes that year. It was herbicide. See, I brought in hay for straw or hay for mulch, and uh, all that hay had been sprayed with an herbicide while in the field as a weed killer, you know, a broad uh, broadleaf killer. It was aminopyrrolate herbicide, and it killed all my broadleaf plants, like tomatoes. So um, I did a video on that, and I discovered that lots and lots of other people are experiencing the same thing. Um, we can't really trust the materials that we bring in from outside of our, our, our gardens, you know. Compost, bagged manure, these are all suspect now because of aminopyrrolates. And the bad advice that I'm hearing online is people are saying, oh no, those gardeners are just overblowing that issue. It's not a big issue. Oh no, there's not really that much of an aminopyrrolate threat. Their herbicide is, is not really out there that much. But friends, every single week I see someone post a picture on Facebook saying, what's wrong with my tomatoes? It's almost always tomatoes because they are so susceptible to it. And they'll show a picture of their leaves and their leaves will be curling up and turning in on themselves. And they'll be literally deformed, growing, you know, growing like a fractal design. You know, they're weird looking leaves. It's not just stress. Yeah, you know, tomatoes will curl their leaves when they're stressed, but these, these are deformed and curling. That's aminopyrrolate herbicide. And people don't know it. 
And more often than not, yes, they've brought in bagged manure. They brought in a bag of black cow. They brought in some, some hay and used it in their garden. And all that was tainted with amino pyrrolid herbicides. We can't trust that stuff. There is a way to do a test though. Here's what you do. If you bring in something like manure, give yourself about four weeks head time. Uh, cut that bag open and plant some bean seeds in it. Just any kind of bean will do and let them grow up and put on a couple of sets of true leaves. If those leaves look healthy and fine, your bag of whatever it is, compost, manure, uh, probably just fine. But if they start to deform and they're curling on themselves and they're not growing right, I'd get rid of that bag real quick. It's not safe. This is not an overblown issue. Charles Dowding has talked about it. David the Good has talked about it. Multiple gardeners who aren't just like new gardeners, but are established and well-respected well gardeners are talking about this issue because it's such an important thing for us to be aware of. It is a very big threat, this aminopyrrolid herbicide that's out there. I have a video on that. You can go watch my videos on aminopyrrolids if you suspect that you've uh, experienced this or if you want to educate yourself. Here's another bit of bad advice. It has to do with watering. Surely you've heard this one and it's a myth. They say, don't water your plants when the sun is shining, especially at midday, because the droplets of water that rest on the leaves will focus the light like a magnifying glass and they'll burn your leaves. This is, this is just nonsense. This has been proven to be a myth over and over. Several university studies have been done on it and it's just not possible on most plants for water to focus light that intensely that it's gonna burn your plants. More often than not, if you see something like that happening, it's another issue altogether. It's not related to water. But you can water whenever you want. I mean, it rains on all the plants and they don't get burned. It rains on all the native plants and they don't get burned. So water your plants whenever you want. There is some issues about watering times that are legitimate though. And this is good advice, but there's a debate. Should I water my plants in the early part of the day or the later part of the day? The thinking goes, if you water your plants in the early part of the day, the ground is not heated up and the, uh, the early part of the day is more mild than you know the high noon and late afternoon. And the water has a chance to soak down into the soil and your plants can take it up. That's valid. But it's also valid that if you water in the evening, the similar kind of thing happens. The plants can take up the water and through the night, that water can sit in that soil and work its way in. Yeah, that works too. But there's a problem if you water midday. Some folks believe that if you water at midday, all your water is basically going to evaporate away before it can percolate into the soil. Well, yeah, if it's 105 degrees, like it sometimes is here, that can happen. You just have to water more. But uh, in that case, I don't want to be standing around in 100 degree weather watering my garden. I'm going to water in the morning or I'm going to water in the evening. So really, watering is not a big deal. Just do it whenever you can. and yeah, water your plants. All right, well, here's another bit of, of bad advice, and it's really, really bad advice. I have clay, black gumbo clay. That's what my soil is mostly. And it's hard to grow stuff in clay. It's hard to dig, it's hard to work with. People say, how do I loosen up my clay? And the bad advice that is almost always handed out is, well, just mix in some sand. No, if you mix in sand, you know what you're doing? You're making concrete, you're making mortar. The structure and the physics of clay is that it is one of the components of the minerals in your soil. Clay is literally ground up rock, it's a mineral. It's the smallest version of ground up minerals there is. And because those particles are so small, they stick together by chemistry, by physics. And sand's not gonna get in there and break that bond. Sand's just gonna get in there and the clay is going to bond to the sand and you're going to have concrete. Never, never, ever put sand in your clay unless you want to build a, you know, a bread oven or something. There are two effective ways to break up clay. One of them has to do with chemistry. Um, rather than putting sand on clay, you can mix gypsum, which is a mineral. You can mix gypsum into your clay. Gypsum is a material that almost acts like an emulsifier. It gets in there and breaks up the, the bonds of the clay and allows the clay to break up. So gypsum is one way, but you know, gypsum, it's expensive. You gotta work it in and no. The easier method is to build on top of your clay. Bring in soil with high organic content. 
And what will happen is that over time, that organic content will release chemicals and will release nutrients that will leach down into your clay and that will begin to break up just the very top surface of that clay. But that little bit of clay broken up like that, the next year it'll get a little deeper and then a little deeper. And as you continue to garden on top of the clay, it's amending the soil beneath and that clay is being loosened up. And so you can come back in a few years and dig down and you've gained some growing depth. You've gained actually a larger portion of your garden and it was easier than if you'd tried to do the gypsum method. Okay, here's some really bad advice. I have seen people online say, when you're done growing in your potting soil, at the end of the year, you have to throw it out. I'm like, what? And their reasoning is they think, well, there's diseases and weed seeds and pests all down in this soil. You gotta throw it out. Friends, if we were doing that, we would be broke. We'd be having to buy new potting soil every single year. Nobody wants to do that. The soil is not nutrient depleted. There's plenty of nutrients left in there. And if in doubt, well, put some, put some slow release fertilizer in there. I have a whole video on reusing and revitalizing potting mix. Go look, go look at that uh, video and learn how to revitalize what you've got so you don't have to break the bank. That video is doing fantastic for me. People are watching that video and really thankful. So if you've been throwing out your potting soil, you don't have to. In fact, let me show you. These are my sweet potato slips and they will be going in for a summer garden but I'm, I gotta grow the slips first. And so these are coming up from the sweet potato chunks that I planted down in there. That peach tree stump is uh, planted in old potting mix. That grapevine is planted in old potting mix. Here's some of my old potting mix being recollected here. All this old potting mix goes to use. Right here, well my Mizuna's looking a little windblown, but this little herb garden, nothing in here but old potting soil. This is potting soil in there and wow, look at those plants. There's nothing wrong with them. Our final bit of advice is not necessarily bad advice, but it has to do with the advice you get. Some of it might actually be perfectly good advice, but that advice needs to apply to your circumstances, to your context. You see, there are uh, dozens of way to, ways to garden. There's raised beds, there's sheet mulching methods, lasagna gardening, uh, in the ground gardening, traditional wide row spacing, hugo culture, uh, no-till. There's all kinds of ways to garden. And if, if you're giving out a bit of advice, you need to understand what context that advice applies to. You wouldn't give the same advice to someone who's tilling their ground every year and piling, piling up huge rows the way the old timers used to do. That's a different way of gardening than, say, uh, no-till gardening, where all you do is put a layer of compost on top of your gardens and you never till it. Well, the advice is gonna be different. Each person needs to get that advice. If they ask for advice, try to find out, okay, well, how do you garden? Do we have the same gardening methods? Is this advice for container gardeners? But that's a whole different thing. You fertilize a totally different way with container garden than you do with gardening in the ground. It's totally different. You can't take the same advice and apply it to another system. So. Find out what kind of gardening it is that you do. Find out what it's called. If you just garden in the ground and you, you dig up a little dirt here and there and make gardens, well, that's, that's in-ground gardening. If you have a raised bed, you gotta know about raised bed gardening. You also, within raised bed gardening, well, are you doing square foot gardening or are you doing traditional gardening in a raised bed? Totally different. You gotta have totally different kinds of soil. You have to follow the rules with, raised, with a square foot gardening very closely or you're quickly gonna ruin your garden. So, that's the advice. Be wise, find out what advice is applicable to you. Don't feel obligated to do all the things. You know if you've been on a, on a forum or a Facebook group for gardeners, you ask a question, you're gonna get 10 different ways to, to, to do it. A lot of the advice you're gonna get is bad. A lot of it's just plain wrong. But a lot of it can be good advice if you know how to apply the advice to your circumstances. So be wise. Well folks, thank you for joining me on Black Gumbo Southern Gardening. I hope this video has been helpful to you. If you find it to be helpful, share it with your friends and subscribe to our channel. Uh, hit the like button, leave a comment, ask questions. We love to interact and comment. So, hey, thanks for joining us today. I hope your gardening season's going well and I hope you have happy gardening. See you next time, bye-bye.